Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Education Matters on Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm your host today, Carol Mon Lee. Our show is called Why Asian American Studies Matter, and we're going to talk about recognizing the importance of the study, the Asian American experience, and how some universities are responding. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 374-2014. Dr. Leanne Day returns home to Hawaii from her first year in a postdoc program at Brandeis University in Boston, where she is currently the Florence K. Fellow in Asian American Pacific Islander Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. She's been teaching courses in Asian American Pacific Islander Studies and will be returning to Brandeis in the fall. Few universities have Asian American programs. Welcome, Leanne. Hi. How are you? Good. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks we'll, for having we'll, me. We'll tell the audience I've known you for many, many, oh, many yes. years. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, you just finished your PhD last year, yeah. and you have many areas of interest, but in particular, this topic is important. Asian American studies matter. Why is that the case, and why is it important now? Um, so I think it's sort of useful to kind of give a context of how I came about this field. Um, you know, I grew up in Hawaii. I never really thought about it. Um, I didn't sort of consider what it meant to have, you know, an Asian immigrant experience or sort of what that de the descendants in Hawaii looks like until I went away to the mainland and I went to college. And I took my first um, intro to Asian American Pacific Islander studies with a professor who's now at UH ah. in the history department, Dr. Rosa. Um, and it completely opened my eyes up to this whole set of experiences and the ways that individuals narrate those experiences through memoir, through poetry, through fiction, um, and that sort of started my interest in thinking particularly about why Hawaii is a different formation than the continental U.S., right? Um, and yet this course was offered on the mainland. It was offered. What school was this? This was actually at Arizona State University. Uh -huh. um, and and they're not that many Asian Americans. There. They're not that many Asian Americans, but it has it does have a higher Pacific Islander population, mm -hmm. um, and so sort of thinking about what it means to be situated in Hawaii in the Pacific in the history of U.S. empire and the history of indigenous genocide, whether it's physical or cultural, um, and then thinking about the sort of influx of Asian migrant laborers, sugar plantations. So how that sort of compares to the mainland um, and ways that we can really think about uh, why these issues matter today, um, especially when it seems like you know we're sort of in fourth generation, fifth generation, um, so why do these things matter? And sort of my answer is two reasons. Like right now under our administration, we're sort of dealing with a lot of, um, I mean, xenophobia, homophobia, racial, um, racism, racism. I mean, just every sort of slew under that gamut. But it's really important to recognize that a lot of this comes out of exclusionary racialized immigration laws that came with Chinese migrants. Right? The Exclusion Act. Exclusion Act. I mean, that's the what first. What year was that? Uh, the Exclusion Act. <laughs> 18 something, I think. Eight, wait, I should know this. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Wait, wait, I do know this. 18, ooh, I should know this. <laughs> well, anyway, anyways, so the anyways. Exclusion Act. Right. And what did it do? So it, it prevented all Chinese migrants from immigrating to Hawaii. Oh, sorry, to Hawaii and the U.S. The U.S. Yeah. It's quite amazing when you articulate that now, that right. we actually had a law on the books that said no Chinese could immigrate to the United States right. or Hawaii. Right. Right. And then the subsequent ones, right, so then they added Japanese immigrants, so the suddenly Japanese immigrants also became excluded, right? It continues layering on. So if you think about that history, then you kind of understand where we are. We're thinking about um, like the Muslim ban, for example. Correct. We're thinking about deportations of undocumented individuals, right? It all stems from the beginning, and you would know this because you're a legal scholar, but it comes from that exclusionary legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's one way we can think about where we are today and how we understand U.S. racial formation. Right. Um, and now you're saying uh, right now there is more of an interest because, of course, the current political climate. Right. But in the past, has there you studied? You studied this course with Professor Rosa, yeah. and that was what about ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And did you major in that field, or was there even a major in that field? There was. So I spent a year at ASU, and then I went back to Scripps College, where they have um, an Asian American program that's through the five colleges. 
but I didn't really want to follow that because I was so interested in what the particularities of Hawaii and sort of like a local Asian dynamic was or is. So I, went to, I ended up just doing English and focusing my senior thesis on Asian American literature produced in Hawaii and thinking about that context. I see. Um, yeah. so now, one of our topics today is the fact that universities don't offer a lot of courses or even degrees or specialties in this area. Right. And why has that been? So, okay, so it's sort of really interesting because University of Hawaii at Manoa obviously has a great ethnic studies department, has indigenous studies, has Asian American Pacific studies, Island. Pacific Islander yeah. studies, um, and the West Coast, primarily California, Washington, Oregon, also have strong programs. But what I realized when I went to Brandeis is that the East Coast is severely lacking in these sort of sort of field ethnic studies in general. Um, usually, actually, I have a statistic which is sort of interesting. Um, which is that Penn and Cornell are the only major schools on the East Coast that have actual Asian American studies programs. And uh, yet there's a pretty sizable, almost sizable. 30 per, 20 percent of the student population is Asian American at, at these schools. At those schools, and not only that, not only just the student population, but the academics, the, the right. instructional right. The staff, right. uh, so many Asian professors and right. uh, scientists and researchers, right. and yet the studies have been very limited right. in terms of a specific right. course of a curriculum. Yeah. And so what sort of happens is usually there might be like a specialty course in the English department or in the sociology department, like Asian Americans and um, social work or something, mm -hmm. or mental health. Mm -hmm. But they're not a long-term program, so that students who are there at that moment can take that course, but then they don't get anything else after it. Um, and what's really exciting, though, is Dartmouth just this year um, implemented a certificate program in Asian American studies, which is really exciting. So Brandeis is trying to build off a lot of that momentum that's sort of happening on the East Coast to get a degree, to get a, to get a certificate program and then a minor. So is that why you went to Brandeis to do your postdoc? You just finished your PhD at University of Washington. Yeah. And so what, what were the opportunities at Brandeis that uh, led you to go to select Brandeis for your um, Because study. the position was specifically both thinking about Asian American and Pacific Islander and thinking about um, how those two intersect, how you can think about indigenous studies in the Pacific and think about Asian American experiences. Um, and I felt like the program, I mean, what's, I mean, I belong to the Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies program, but there is no Asian American Pacific Islander program. Like, I am the program. You are the program. So there's nobody else teaching a course yeah. in Asian American yes. culture, experiences, yes. studies. So then you were the yeah. only person. Yes. Um, now, of course, even in my day back at, in the East Coast, we had courses in Chinese art, yes. Yes. Japanese art, but very dedicated to the East Asian studies. Yes, East or Asian, South Asian studies. studies. Exactly. The yes. core culture as yes. opposed to the blend of right. the Asian American experience. Or the diasporic experience. Yes. Um, yeah, so there are a few courses. Um, like one of my mentors at Brandeis teaches South Asian American literature. Uh, but we're South Asian American literature. So in usually I typically see. like Indian American literature mm -hmm. in relationship to Indian diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of those types of courses but they need to be housed in an actual program so students, A, have a reason for taking them besides personal interest, right? So it right. fits a program, it fits a minor. Right. Um, and it also shows the university's support of like why this matters. So how many courses are there now? You're teaching how many courses in Asian American um, studies? I taught one in the, in the fall and one in the spring. <laughs> teaching one in the fall. And that's all that Brandeis is offering right now? Yes. And is there a plan to expand that program to include maybe even a specialty or a certificate? Right, right. Um, so it's really great because in 2015, the students at Brandeis organized and petitioned the dean and demanding that there be an Asian American Studies program. So this is all student driven, it's students demanding this from the administration, which I think is really indicative of how much it matters. Can you, is there a percentage of, uh, do you know what the percentage of Asian American students were involved either in this in this uh, request or population at Brandeis. The population at Brandeis is thirteen percent of the, Asian Americans. Uh -huh. And yeah. did that correlate with the people who, who were asking for the? Yes. Course? Yes. <laughs> so I mean, there was a core group, right, who right. who you mm -hmm. know documented the demands and but led protests. Um, and so so essentially, what happened is that led to the hire of just. Um, I believe he was a graduate student at the time. And so he taught the first Asian American experience class, and that was the year before I came. And then they led to the, the founding of a postdoc position for me. 
and then now we're working to try and sort of advocate for a long-term position and to build a program actually at Brandeis. And so what would that program look like for Brandeis? Like, are you, are you uh, using another school's program? I know that mm. Princeton has something similar. Yes, Princeton has something that's similar. Um, and then I've actually talked to a colleague at Wellesley, um, and they built a program as well. So I think sort of the ideal is to get cross listings from courses that already exist. So whether it's, um, you know, modern Chinese art um, or if there's, um, something on public health and immigrant History. communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that, that could be cross-listed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the plan. So work with what we have and then build. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Right, so do you see any particular um, challenges to this actually happening in the next right. two to five years? Um, yes. <laughs> what are those? I think, I think it's hard right now because I've had great enrollment in my classes, but it's hard because they're taking it without, it's just an elective for them. So it doesn't count to a minor, it doesn't count to a major. And these students are so motivated. I mean, they're double majors, minors, they're leading student clubs. So this is really time that they're taking out of their own schedule to come to my class. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's hard because the reward for the student has to be completely personally motivated. The personal stakes are so high that they're going to take, An know, elective that yes. doesn't count toward any but it's also a rigorous class because, of yeah. course, I'm assigning a lot and wanting them to engage in the material. What kind of material do you use? Everything. Um, okay. So, so I taught a survey course, so an intro, and so that's you know a historically based course. So we I use a lot of historiographies, but I supplemented with memoirs. Like um, whose memoirs? Carlos Bulosan, America's in the Heart, um, touted as the first uh, Filipino American memoir and Asian American memoir. Mm -hmm. um, I also taught Mary Pack Lee's Quiet Odyssey, which is the story of a Korean American woman, which is very rare for the early uh, migration period. And then um, I love teaching novels because I'm still an English scholar. So I taught um, No No Boy by John Okada, which yes. is about um, the No No Boys and the loyalty questionnaire during World War II. And then I try and move it into a little more contemporary. So I taught um, Everything I Never Told You by Celeste Ng. Um, and then this last semester, I was trying to teach more Hawaii-based text. So we did things from Bamboo Ridge Press, so like Daryl Lum, Eric Chalk, um, Nora Ogja Keller. Uh, and then even I taught The Descendants. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Yes, I and we watched up. the movie, too, as part of the class. <laughs> the famous George Clooney movie filmed yes. here in Hawaii. Yes, with his um, tan that they had to add to his skin oh. <laughs> to darken him. <laughs> so what's the response from your students that come um, to the class? Not to sound, you know. So one, they've never learned that history. They've never learned the history of exclusionary immigration, ever. Right? They didn't understand what the loyalty oath was for World War II, even though there's a discussion now of internment camps. So the sort of range of knowledge that they began to see and the patterns you can see in, in how the U.S. responds to racialized migration. Right? So, okay, first it's Ch Chinese, then it's Korea, then it's Japanese, then, right. then it's South Asian, right? right. So the production of whiteness through these exclusionary laws really became clear to them. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the historical side. And then I felt like they were really making political connections to like why this matters to know this. And then on sort of like a more um, entertaining side, actually being exposed to experiences that they related to, whether they were fictional um, accounts or memoir, I, the students found really rewarding that their experiences mattered or um, like their parents' um, immigrant stories had another voice somewhere else, right? So like they count. They matter. Right, they matter. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Lee. And we're going to go to a short break. This is Carol Mon Lee on Education Matters with my guest, Dr. Lee Ann Day. And we're talking about why Asian American studies matter. And we'll be right back. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests 
are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee on Education Matters with my guest, Dr. Lee Ann Day, and we're talking about the why Asian American studies matter. So we spent the first half talking about your actual experience this past year at Brandeis, mm -hmm. what you've been teaching, what other universities are doing, and yep. where the movement is toward increasing that. Let's talk a little bit about some of your past work. I know that you, um, we had mentioned The Descendants, the movie mm -hmm. The Descendants made here in Hawaii. Yep. Uh, and uh, I understand one of your chapters in your PhD dissertation was about that. Yes. Um, so I actually, the dissertation chapter is on the novel itself by Cowie Hart Hemmings. Uh, Kanaka writer here. Um, and so what my dissertation also tries to do is it pairs historical events of U.S. empire in the 19th and 20th century. So for example, in the Descendants chapter, I talk about the Mahele, 1848 Mahele. And I talk about the privatization of land, the division of land as, um, as a consequence of U.S. empire and how that sort of historical trajectory of land dispossession, indigenous dispossession, plays out in a contemporary novel, right? right. So, so it's not a novel that's written, you know, in 1852 no. about a Kuleana. No, it's not parcel. historical. It's not, it's not that, right? It's no. a contemporary novel that's reimagining yeah. what that history is and putting it into a contemporary context. So I read The Descendants, the novel, um, as this, this uh, reflection of that dispossession of land so even though Matt King, right, is, feels very conflicted about, oh, I have... The lead character. The lead character, right, has, I am the ancestor, I'm the descendant of Hawaiian royalty, um, what do I do with this land that I've inherited? And he struggles over this, right? And um, this is, sorry, spoil alert, right? <laughs> he decides to keep the land, but he does it under the guise of wanting to maintain ownership for his own family and almost as this sort of... Uh, retaliation against his wife's affair. And so I read that as the ways in which U.S. empire continues to produce even the ways that we think are fictitious. So mm. when you create a fictional novel, right, you can, you can write about anything, right? You, you don't have to think about U.S. empire or you don't have to think about the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. But I'm saying that actually it still persists, right? right? So it's the genre of the novel, which is a Western form of writing. Um, and the, the sort of legacy of U.S. empire and ideologies are so strong that they constrain what we can imagine in fiction, which is horrifying if you're an English scholar, right? Because it says that the novel still is produced by these colonial apparatuses uh, of thinking. Right. Okay. And I, I think that there's a way to read the novel where it resists in those moments. Okay. But to, to link literature and the history of colonial dispossession is what I'm trying to do. So what was the broader topic for your dissertation? Um, this so is just one chapter. This is one chapter. So I look at various moments. So another one is um, I look at the 1865 uh, act, to seg act, act to separate um, those suspected with leprosy to Molokai, to incarcerate. right? And I pair that with a contemporary novel that reimagines what that looked like for a Kanaka Maoli female. I see. So have you published your dissertation? Not yet. Okay. I'm, so I'm working on turning it into a book manuscript. Uh-huh. And what about chapters of it? I, is, I see some of the um, Intimate Relations, Land and Love yes. and the Descendants. That was published in uh, Critical Insights, mm -hmm. Multicultural Identity. Is that yeah. a... So it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, um, it's a collection of essays that are specifically geared towards teaching undergraduates, mm -hmm. um, sort of like literary analysis and multicultural sort of ways of reading. And so in that one, I actually look at the movie and I look at the soundtrack, which uses Gabby Pahanui throughout. Um, and I link it to sort of how the director, um, Alexander Payne, used the selection of Hawaiian songs to sort of mimic what's happening in the narrative and what happens when you look at the soundtrack and the film with the novel and the narrative itself. Because right. we talked earlier that you have been teaching a course on pop culture. Yes, and this yes. Is really I love pop right culture. <laughs> so tell us about that course you taught this past year at um, Brandeis. Yeah. And how did that relate to the Asian American experience or beyond? Um, so it was actually because the students that were working on the, um, like the student task force were like, you know, it would be really great would be a pop culture class because we have Fresh Off the Boat, which is the ABC TV show. We have Crazy Rich Asians coming out. There seems to be a lot of talk 
but what's what representation looks like. And a like. lot of comedians. We were talking about a lot of comedians yeah. who are Asian American. Ali Wong. Um, and then we were Mar also um, Margaret Cho. Margaret Cho ago. as well. Joe Court. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and See, I even know a few of these too. Yeah, I'm and also there really were all those it. issues of right, sort of um, of yellow face casting. Yes, representation. Representation right? matters. Yes. Of yes. Um, so the course was framed around those ideas, and what sort of came out of it that I hadn't expected is that a lot of the students who didn't take my first class were sort of lacking in some of the historical context for why um, why you have the Asian nerd character, like from the Goonies. Mm -hmm. Like where does that come out of? Or why do you have- The glasses and the engineer. Yes, yes, yeah, like I make everything, like where does that, because it all stems from like the model minority production, right? Like ah, they are good at science, they are good at math, right? So we sort of broke apart these archetypes and saw how they, um, how they both developed, they became- get perpetuated. get perpetuated. Yeah, and so it was most exciting to see when we were reading things produced by, um, like Eddie Wong, when we read his memoir and we watched the pilot of Fresh Off the Boat and we compared it with his, um, in 20, 2014 he broke with the show, claiming that it didn't represent his experiences and that they had turned it into sort of a palatable sitcom for the broader audience, the broad yes. white American family. Um, and so having students be able to engage with that level of cultural criticism, mm -hmm. like see the original text, see it being depicted on a TV show, and then hearing what the author himself thought of it. Right? Well, what do you think of it? Do you think it's sold out, basically? I mean, I think a memoir is very different than a sitcom. A family sitcom, a 30-minute sitcom, is a very particular genre, right? Right. You have to relate to some, to some component. And it has to have a certain mass appeal to get on TV right. and an audience and right. stay on. Right. So right. I, I think they're different. I, see. I think it's great to have Fresh Off the Boat, especially because it took 20 years between Margaret Cho's All American Girl to Fresh Off the Boat to actually have a, 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 a regular show. Yes, yeah. a regular show. Um, so I think there's great steps there. I, I think that it, when you read the memoir, you understand what's lacking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a larger problem of like Hollywood and broadcast television. I don't think it's something, you know, one show can fix or right. something like that. Well, I know you're also studying, you also have very many other areas of interest. And let's talk about some of those. And I'm going to, let's see. Besides American literature, because you're an English yes. major, um, let's talk about some of your uh, Pacific Studies and literature interests, because that kind of relates to this in general. Right. Yeah. The Asian American experience. So, are, are there many uh, specific um, programs in Pacific Island Studies? No. Um, fewer than in Asian. Fewer. Yes. Even fewer. Um, but actually, the University of Washington, my alma mater, just instituted after 40, like literally a very 40 years of sort of constantly advocating for this, but they ju just instituted a Pacific Oceanic Studies certificate and minor within Ethnic Studies, so it's really, really exciting. Um, and they're the only one besides UH Manoa that has that, mm -hmm. although I've, I've heard that University of Utah is also working on one. Um, but I, what I've done at Brandeis, actually, to think about Pacific Studies, because the, the population is like 0.1%. 0.1%, percent. Right. Right. <laughs> so small. it's very, yeah. very small. Um, but what um, what it does actually screened this amazing documentary by Ciara Lacey out of state, um, which uh, she premiered I think a year and a half ago at the Hawaii Film Festival. But it's about incarcerated Kanaka Maoli men who are sent to privatized prisons in Arizona, where they actually learn. But it's where they learn Hawaiian language and dance, and they come back to Hawaii and have to figure out like where is home and how do you how do you sort of integrate integrate right. yeah. how do you navigate how does culture help you through these processes so i screened that at brandeis and then we actually had um, a skype q and a with ciara herself to talk about these issues is there a big interest in that course there so it's not a, sorry it's not a course it was just a uh, an oh, event, the movie yes an event you showed, that you showed I, the movie yes right. um, but as part of your course i was extra credit for my extra course. credit i see <laughs> Um, but How it, was the attendance? Just it was curious. it was good. Um, I think a lot of people were interested in sort of the ways it intersects with thinking about mass incarceration and thinking through masculinity. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a Pacific identity that's being Correct. worked through, mm -hmm. but it becomes this really useful vehicle to think through, like why um, cultural performance, why olala Hawaii, like why learning the language matters and what it does. So that's sort of one example of like how I try and bring Pacific studies into um, what I'm doing at Brandeis. Um, and I think it's 
Honestly, it's even useful just to show a map of the Pacific uh -huh. and like name how many different islands there are because the East Coast is like what? <laughs> Wait, <laughs> there's different forms of Oceania, right? It's not it's not all Polynesia. There's Micronesia. There's Melanesia. Yeah. There's like all of these islands. You're right, it's too uh, far away for them. Totally, to yeah. but it's but it's so useful to start that conversation because then they start to think about like oh, but what about native genocide on the continent? Like who who is represented here? even though it seems longer ago, right? Okay. And you're also interested in gender studies? Yes. And well, what is that, how does that fit into all of the well, I don't bigger picture? You, I just don't think you can think like race and class without gender and sexuality, right? It's an intersectional approach and that there's something, um, what, you know, whether you're thinking about the concept of marriage or masculinity and, and indigenous identity that comes through the way gender is organized under a heteropatriarchal white systemic. So, so how do you compare then the Asian American mm -hmm. gender issues versus the Pacific Islander gender issues? Do you do anything Ooh. like that, that kind of a comparative? Um, not a direct comparison. Mm -hmm. I, I'm more sort of thinking through different locations where you can see maybe that happening through gender on the plantations or like a plantation narrative, and then thinking through the plantation narrative in Hawaii and Hawaii, and where it's primarily Asian Americans as opposed to Pacific Islanders. Yes. So then right. taking up. Um, I mean, taking up like Hanani K. Trask's poetry mm -hmm. and thinking through the, the construction of femininity and sort of how these both occur in the same geographical space, but in very different ideological planes. So how do you read them together? So how mm -hmm. do you think through gender? Right. It, it, so, but it's not direct, in the, does that make sense? Right. It's like parallel. Okay. Yeah. Well, Leanne, this has gone by so fast, we only have a minute left. Okay. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is to look into camera four okay. and to give our audience your thoughts on the future of American, Asian American studies and why it's so important. I think to really understand U.S. racial formation is, or the construction of race in the U.S., you have to think through both African American studies and Asian American studies. Um, and so go see Crazy Rich Asians, you know, go, go check out, there's so many authors, right? Like, who Look are, at, watch sorry. the Descendants again. Watch the Descendants again and think about, especially if you're from Hawaii, like how how is Hawaii being constructed and how are Asian Americans being constructed in this narrative? Um, and I think one thing that I just want to say that might be useful is that a lot of my international students talk about how they didn't become Asian American until they came to the U.S. <laughs> right? So they were Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and then until they came to the U.S., then they're like, oh, I'm an Asian American. What is an Asian American? And what does that mean politically? So right. just that's my little okay. thing to think about. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Leanne. It's been a really interesting topic. And we we'll hope you come back. Yes. <laughs> and come back to Hawaii yes. longer term. <laughs> OK, well, thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the end of our show. We've enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm your host, Carol Mon Lee. And we've been talking about why Asian American studies matter with my guest, Dr. Leanne Day. If you want to see this show again, Go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii, where there will be a link to this show and many more just like this one. ThinkTech is a 501c3 Hawaii nonprofit digital media company dedicated to raising public awareness about issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands. Thank you so much to our studio staff and to all the people who watch, care, and contribute to our ThinkTech Hawaii productions. We'll see you on our next show. Aloha. Thank you.